Good morning. I'm Cynthia Powell. I'm a pediatrician and a clinical geneticist at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I'm going to be talking about a project um, that we have called NC Nexus for North Carolina newborn exome sequencing for universal screening. Uh, in this, we are partnering with RTI International. What I wanted to do is give you a brief background about standard newborn screening, which has been one of the most successful public health programs in our country's history. What are some of the limitations to adding additional conditions to newborn screening? The potential of using next generation sequencing, whether it's whole genome or whole exome sequencing in screening of newborns, and some of the ethical issues that have been raised about use of this new technology in newborn screening. I'll explain our research study that examines the possibility and potential of using next-gen sequencing to improve the sensitivity and specificity of current newborn screening and to also increase the number of conditions that we might be able to screen for in newborns and ways in which we're exploring these issues and helping parents make decisions about whether they would like to have their child participate. So newborn screening, by definition, is a public health program aimed at the early identification of conditions for which early and timely intervention can prevent or reduce associated uh, mortality and morbidity. So on the left is a woman uh, with untreated PKU. Uh, this is how most individuals with a condition called phenoketonuria used to end up uh, because they weren't diagnosed until they developed severe uh, intellectual disability, what, which in those days was called mental retardation, and many ended up in institutions. Um, on the right is a young woman who was detected through newborn screening as having PKU. She was started on a special diet within the first few weeks of life, and although she has to drink a special uh, supplement giving her appropriate proteins, um, she's uh, cognitively normal, normal intelligence leading a very uh, normal life. So um, a number of years ago, additional conditions uh, were able to be detected through newborn screening, but there was a lot of variability in the country between one state to another. Some states were only testing for three or four conditions, and other states were testing for uh, up to 29 or 30 different conditions. So in order to make a more uh, standardized number of conditions uh, across the U.S., uh, screened for in each state, um, there, were, uh, there was a task force organized um, through HRSA that uh, recommended 29 conditions. This has evolved into what's now called the Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children. New conditions can be nominated. And some of the limitations to being able to screen newborns for various conditions is that there's no screening tool available or that the screening tool is too expensive or that there's no treatment um, as there is uh, for classic conditions such as PKU. Uh, there are now 32 conditions that are on this uh, recommended uniform screening panel, and those include not only conditions that can be tested for uh, through taking a blood sample, the, um, the heel prick that newborns have before they are discharged from the hospital, uh, as well as now testing for uh, critical congenital heart defects through measuring the oxygen level in a baby's blood, and also um, newborn hearing screening, uh, which is also done uh, prior to an infant being discharged from the hospital. And molecular genetic testing is being utilized more and more in standard newborn screening to uh, figure out exactly what an underlying problem is, um, whether it's as a second tier test after initial screening identifies the possibility of cystic fibrosis or when a child is found to have an abnormal hemoglobin uh, and uh, it needs to be determined whether they have sickle cell disease or another type of uh, what's called a hemoglobinopathy. Also, after a screen positive case, um, molecular genetic testing is often utilized to further characterize conditions such as a severe combined immunodeficiency or um, hearing loss. So theoretically, a 
barrier to adding any condition to newborn screening can be overcome if the underlying uh, molecular uh, etiology or cause of a condition is established. Um, Wilson and Younger uh, initially came out with guidelines for screening in populations, and um, these are some of the rules that have been followed as guidance for uh, adding conditions to newborn screening. But one of the things that they said um, a number of years ago is that the central idea of early disease detection and treatment is simple, but the path to its successful achievement is far from simple, although it sometimes can appear easy. So um, as we have uh, looked at uh, research projects um, into the potential use of whole exome sequencing in newborns, um, there are uh, a lot of ethical issues that we are concerned about and are studying. And I wanted to review some of the ethical issues that have been raised. One of those is the possibility of um, finding incidental or secondary things. So what are these? Um, incidental findings are, um, regardless of what type of uh, test you're talking about, these are things that you find that aren't related to the original intent of testing. And for example, if someone has a CT scan after they're in a car accident um, and uh, they happen to find uh, a tumor, um, so that wasn't the initial purpose of having the CT scan, but a tumor is found. Um, so that's an example of an incidental finding. So we've been dealing with these for many years in healthcare. So with next generation sequencing, if we're looking at um, all of the coding regions of genes, uh, you might find uh, that a person has a variant or, or a mutation in a gene that's related to breast or colon cancer or cardiac arrhythmias or intellectual disability. And so what information should be reported back to patients um, or families? Another issue is um, the fact that if we're testing newborns, they really aren't old enough to consent to having these procedures done. And so what about the rights of that child to decide later on whether or not they even wanted this information? So this is something uh, that's called protecting the autonomy of the child. But then we also have to balance with that the rights of parents to have information about their children. So a child's autonomy might be impacted if we're talking about uh, giving results back for adult onset conditions. Um, this uh, may be part of what's called pre-symptomatic genetic testing, where sometimes we do um, do genetic testing on individuals for things that we know won't impact them until later on. Um, again, what about the right of a child not to know this information? There are also concerns about genetic discrimination when that child gets older. Um, again, versus the rights of parents to have information about their child. Um, as an example, where we have shared this information for many years, um, testing newborns for sickle cell <clears throat> anemia has been, done, has been done since the um, 1970s. And during that time, um, in most states, the um, carrier status, or what's called having sickle cell trait, has been reported back to individuals. And nowadays, in many states where genetic testing is done for CF carrier status, um, for cystic fibrosis carrier status, uh, this information is, is typically revealed as well. So um, there's been very limited uh, data about this. What are the outcomes? And uh, this is one of the, the things that we hope to learn more about. Um, but in the, the limited research studies that have been done in this area, there have not been shown to be harmful or de deleterious effects to children when they become adults and have learned this information. So um, if we're testing children for certain conditions that may not impact them until they're adults, um, let's look at that a little bit more. And uh, an example of that would be having a mutation in the breast cancer gene, um, such as uh, what uh, the actress Angelina Jolie learned about that was present um, in herself uh, based on uh, the family history that she had with um, her mother having ovarian cancer. So uh, BRCA mutations, BRCA1 and 2 mutations are in 
associated with an increased risk of breast and ovarian cancer. But the youngest age um, that it, it may manifest itself is usually um, year 18 years of age. And most women um, with this don't uh, develop the cancer until they're uh, at an older age. Um, but because it is an autosomal dominant condition, it's um, likely inherited from a parent. So just to show this, um, there's a, a child, uh, let's say, identified with a BRCA1 mutation. Um, that's their father. This is what we call a pedigree, which we always do in um, our patients who come through our genetics clinics. And then um, likely uh, the child uh, inherited this from one parent or the other. And in this example, uh, it's been inherited from the mother. So is saving the life of a parent because you learn this information through the child and then could test the parents and uh, let the mother know that she is at an increased risk for breast and ovarian cancer, um, is, that enough to, um, is that enough of a benefit to warrant testing a child? So, um, but others have argued that children should not have screening to provide genetic information about their parents. Why not just uh, test the parents directly? Uh, another thing that we're looking at is broadening the definition of treatable. So as I said, conditions like PKU, we can identify in a child, put them on a special diet right away, and we can prevent them from developing intellectual disability slash mental retardation. Um, but our, um, why screen for conditions that don't fulfill the de definition of treatable in the traditional sense, such as those associated with intellectual disability? And um, one of the reasons for doing this is that it can help end what's called uh, the diagnostic odyssey, where parents are searching for the reason for problems in their child, um, should they develop delays in development, uh, late in you know, speech development, or possibly having um, a lot of medical problems. Um, this can avoid unnecessary and expensive testing and um, decrease the time to interventions, such as um, you know, early intervention uh, services, physical therapy, and those types of things. Also, it would allow um, the family to be informed about any potential genetic risk um, if they have additional children. So um, as you heard about, um, the uh, NIH uh, requested applications um, in this area to look at some of the implications and challenges and opportunities involving genomic sequence information um, in the newborn period. So the overarching aims for our study are to look at how we might extend the utility of current newborn screening to devise a clinically oriented research framework for analysis of next generation sequencing in newborns and to develop best practices that might be incorporated into standard clinical care. Uh, the uh, groups that we'll be studying include uh, children from uh, early age up to age five years with uh, conditions that are currently identified through standard newborn screening, um, including PKU and other conditions, um, metabolic conditions, cystic fibrosis, hearing loss. And then uh, another group with uh, diagnosed conditions that are not currently on the newborn screening panel, but for which um, some people have uh, suggested, you know, might be uh, important to include, and um, those are, are listed there. Um, and then finally, we have a group of uh, babies who, whose mothers and fathers will be ascertained and recruited uh, during uh, their pregnancies with the child, and um, this is uh, what we're terming the well child group. And um, my uh, co-principal uh, investigator in this project, Jonathan Berg, has developed um, what we call an age-based modified metric system, which looks at uh, conditions um, and whether or not there's treatment or actionability for them versus uh, the age of onset for conditions. And so if you um, look at the um, upper upper left hand uh, quadrant there, um, you'll see conditions such as PKU, um, so ones that are currently screened for and others that um, we think may be uh, beneficial to screen for. And so we're calling this the next generation sequencing newborn screening category. 
Then if you look at uh, conditions um, up in the upper right-hand corner, uh, such as breast cancer gene mutations. So those would be actionable. You can um, do uh, increased surveillance, some mammography, or some individuals may elect to have um, mastectomies done to prevent uh, breast cancer. And so this would be um, in the adult onset medically actionable category. And then finally, conditions that impact children, but for which there's no real treatment, established treatment yet. Um, oh, some, you know, might have uh, some research protocols, others such as Tay-Sachs disease, um, really no uh, treatment at this point. Rett syndrome is another example of that. And so that's a childhood onset, but non-medically actionable condition. And finally, those um, conditions such as Alzheimer's disease that wouldn't begin until adulthood and for which at least at this time, unfortunately, there's no treatment. And that would be adult onset, non-medically actionable. So we are um, uh, breaking down these different categories um, in terms of what information might we want to give back to families. And as you can see, this um, line here is uh, can vary if you know better treatments become available, more conditions would go into uh, the NGS, NBS category. And the line between adult and childhood onset is often quite blurred uh, because many conditions can have onset in children um, or adulthood, and there's no way of determining that. And for our project, we will not be returning um, or giving families the option of learning about any of the adult onset non-medically actionable conditions. But again, um, that category may change as, you know, treatments develop, uh, you know, such as treatment for Alzheimer's. If there was some way to, you know, treat a child early on to prevent Alzheimer's, then that, you know, uh, gene may, may change. Um, Okay, so um, we score individual genes to determine what category they should be placed in. And um, again, this NGS, NBS category, um, and the way that we do this involves what's the severity of the condition, what's the likelihood that if a person inherits the gene that they'll have a severe outcome, uh, what types of interventions are available, um, how easy would it be to, um, you know, intervene with, with the uh, the intervention of uh, the treatment. Um, how acceptable would it be? Is it getting a daily uh, shot? Is it being on a special diet? Um, is it, you know, having an organ removed? Something like that all plays a role into the acceptability. And then what's our knowledge base? For some conditions, there's a lot of literature about uh, the, the genetic condition. For other things, there may only be one or two papers. So we, we score those conditions. Um, and uh, so in doing this, um, we take away those, quote, incidental findings. So no genetic changes will be revealed um, through sequencing that are incidental. Um, as an, just an example of one of the conditions that may fit into this next generation sequencing newborn screening category is um, called multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2B. This is a condition that causes thyroid cancer um, in infants um, with certain genetic types of gene changes in uh, the RET gene. And um, all children with these certain mutations will develop thyroid cancer. 50% um, will develop another type of tumor called a pheochromocytoma. Um, at least half of the individuals don't have a positive family history. The condition arises due to what's called a new mutation. Um, and it's not suspected unless there is a family history, and infants at birth look perfectly normal and healthy. So the benefit of identifying the mutation would be that you could prevent the cancer by removing the thyroid, um, and you could monitor the occurrence of the other tumors through special um, screening of um, biochemical levels. And um, so this would really impact a person's medical management. So looking at this um, with, in terms of the information that would be reported back, um, we will be uh, uh, randomizing uh, people who decide to participate in the project into different groups. One will only get um, the information related to their child's underlying condition, if that's known, or to um, what's in that, that next-gen sequencing newborn screening category. 
Others will have the option of getting additional information, such as non-medically um, actionable childhood onset or adult onset medically actionable conditions or carrier status. And we will not analyze this information unless the parents request it. Um, and uh, one other thing is that um, this adult onset non-medically actionable, we will not analyze or report back. Um, so this is what the, uh, the groups look like um, in terms of those with uh, known conditions, those um, in the healthy cohort. Again, they'll be randomized into one who won't get any additional results and those with um, the ability to make decisions about what information they would like to have. We're utilizing uh, saliva samples um, instead of uh, blood spots uh, just because of sort of the, the timing of when we'll obtain the samples after getting uh, consent from families. And um, the, uh, another part of our project, the ELSI component of our project, is to develop best practices to incorporate next-gen newborn screening into clinical care by exploring these ethical, legal, and social issues involved in informed decision-making and return of results. And our colleagues at um, RTI have developed uh, decision aid tools to help families do this. And this is just one screenshot from uh, one of the decision aids, and it will help families have a better understanding about what newborn screening is. It will uh, explain traditional newborn screening conditions and those in these um, additional categories that we'll be looking at. So. Um, and then uh, it will let us see how parents are thinking about this because we're very interested in that um, information. So do they want to have their child go through genomic sequencing? Are they not sure? Uh, do they, uh, you know, decide, no, I don't want to have this done? And uh, so that's one of the things that we'll be studying in our research project. And uh, these are uh, many people who make up the uh, team, our NC Nexus team, both at UNC and RTI. And I'd like to acknowledge all of them, especially my um, other PI, Jonathan Berg, Don Bailey at RTI, uh, Chris Reaney, um, who's at UNC in charge of our Project 3, and Megan Lewis, who's our um, Project 3 uh, co-PI at RTI, and our project coordinator, Laura Milko, and many others who help us in the um, actionability scoring.